Good evening and welcome to the Committee of the Whole meeting for April 13th, 2022. And uh, I'll declare the meeting open at 6.01 p.m. Uh, at this time, I'd like to confirm the agenda. So are there any em emergent items from any of the councillors tonight? Seeing none, uh, administration. We don't have anything, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. I'm looking for then a, a motion to confirm the agenda as presented. Um, Councillor Langmaid. Uh, I'll move to confirm the agenda as presented. Thank you. You've all heard the motion. All in favor? Thank you. And just before we move on to delegations, I just wanted to take a moment to... Uh, thank our fire department and the members of our fire department who have donated a, a lot of equipment and uh, clothing like uh, their, 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 their large uh, jackets to, to Ukraine to help them in their, in their emergency efforts and in their firefighting efforts. Uh, we all know what's happening in Ukraine. So I just wanted to take a, a bit of time to, to thank the firefighters in our community. They do a great deal to keep our people safe, but here they are also uh, going out of their way to make sure that this country that's being ravaged can also have emergency care and fire department care. So thank you to the fire department and to the chief and his, uh, his officers. And that brings us to delegations for tonight. Uh, item 3.1, we have a delegation uh, concerning the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program. So uh, I'd like to welcome you and uh, call you up. And if you need to raise your podium, you have a magic button there. And if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself so the public at home can, uh, can sure. know. Sure. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pat. Uh, it's Kevin Corpy from Tim Hortons. And uh, my name is Usman Judd from McDonald's. Perfect. So we're here. We've got a bit of support here as well. Uh, Pete is here, Belinda and uh, Jane from the, uh, the Roadhouse and the station and the travel lodge are here as well as small business owners in town. Um, we're all concerned about the, the uh, labor situation in town. Um, for, uh, the employment market has gotten a lot tighter and as the economy recovers, we're quite concerned about the impact it's going to have on our businesses and our uh, ability to function in the future is really uh, what we're, we're here to talk about today. Okay, so Usman's going to say a few words about the about the. Are you going to flip? Yes, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So the, the the current situation, we've all gone through this this global pandemic, and it's it's devastated a lot of restaurants, particularly here in town, uh, in in a lot of ways. And and we were able to operate, you know, drive-throughs where, where where Kevin and I could, and other uh, QSRs that had drive-throughs, uh, but but other restaurants were able to. Um, you know, rely on things like uh, curbside and, and, and delivery, but that wasn't the same as it was before. So there's been a massive impact uh, in, in a, from a sales perspective over the last couple of years. We've also seen a drastic shift when it comes to labor availability. Uh, Strathmore has been, uh, you know, we reside in, in Alberta and we've all seen the, the different cycles of booms and busts in the past. Um, the, the last major shortage would have been uh, in the early 2010, 11 time, and we all remember what what that looked like, and and we we wear those scars of you know late nights closing and not having enough staff and and people just not wanting to come into work because it was highly stressful when you didn't have enough people and and you couldn't hire, uh, and I, and I'm and I'm looking ahead at the summer now and we're we're getting back to that level of of demand coming up, but the labor market drying up. So what we're finding is uh, we're getting applications from students or or people who are uh, looking at limited availabilities and can't work the, the later night hours or the early morning hours or, or overnight. Um, I know uh, to now, uh, Kevin and I and, and a lot of the other uh, owners in town have been able to maintain the level of service that we have, but we're really afraid what the summer is going to bring. Uh, a program like this is, is, is game changing because it, it, it allows us to recruit uh, locally and, and bring people in and integrate them into our community. Uh, so with that, I'll have Kevin kind of help explain sure. the, the program a little bit more. So, so that's a bit of the background of what we're up against. It's a, it's a tough market out there, and I'm sure you've been hearing it from everyone in town that it's, it's tough. It's, it's not a lot of people around looking for work, and I think anyone in town that's looking for work would have found a job by now. I mean, there's no one, I don't think there's anyone out there that is available to work that hasn't been able to find a job. So that brings us to this program, the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program, uh, AAIP, just came out from the province a little over a month ago. 
uh, and it's available as a way for us to bring non-skilled worker, workers into the community through an immigration program that's locally controlled. So rather than going through the federal government, this has a local control, which we're going to take you through. So the, the first step is for the community to express an interest in getting involved and becoming an AAIP community, making an application to the, to the province. We gotta meet, there's some certain criteria we have to meet. We, it's a pretty in-depth application and it's not gonna be simple, it's a lot of work. But I think all the, a lot of the building blocks are already there and your economic development officer has already been doing some of the pre-work on it as well. So the way it would work is once the town has made an application and been approved to be an AAIP community, we would, as businesses in town on our own, we would recruit uh, uh, foreign workers to, come to move to town. So we would on our own, we'd work with recruiters, we would identify people that want to come, and uh, that would be the first step to, to attract foreign nationals. We would then present them with an, a job offer. The, it would then go to a three-person committee that's set up by the town that would administer this program. And we would have the foreign worker expressing an interest, the job offer from us, and then it needs an endorsement from the city or from the committee that's, net, that's operating this. If all of that comes together, then, there's a, then the application would be approved. That person would come to Canada as an immigrant and automatically receive a provincial nomination for permanent residency. So it's a, it's a great program. It's really slick. It's locally controlled. We're not counting on someone from Ottawa to make the decisions on who's coming to town or if businesses are able to use this. You're gonna make those decisions locally. And I'll, I'll add, um, so th the way the foreign worker program works today and, the, and some of the pitfalls that it has is a lot of workers will come, which will follow uh, the recruitment process that we take on, like step three, we'll, we'll hire the worker, they'll come to Strathmore, but they won't stay because they can go get PR in Saskatchewan. They can go get PR in in Banff, um, and, and the, the first day they're here, they're looking for the next step, and they're not really integrating into the community, where this process allows them to have a surety that they're likely gonna become permanent, so they come to Strathmore with a connection to Strathmore, because Strathmore has helped get them here. And, and, and in all likelihood, it, it transforms the journey for this worker. They, they integrate from day one, versus them feeling like they're in Canada, but they're not sure if they're going to be able to stay in Canada. And, and when you have that mindset, you're looking to get out to wherever you can. And, and we lose these people very quickly. Um, so, so this program allows for integration into the community from day one, and, and we'd be able to benefit from you know, their families coming over and, and, and them being future citizens of, of, of Strathmore and being able to contribute to the community versus what we have uh, today. And, and, and even the program today is extremely cumbersome, and, and we just don't even bother with it because you're, you're, you're paying high fees, you're not sure if you're gonna get an approval, and if you get the approval and the person shows up, they're likely not gonna stay because the grass is greener on the other side because they, somebody's telling them they can help them get their permanent residency. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to just quickly call out is the work that uh, the Economic Development Officer has put into this. As Kevin said, this program was launched a month ago. Uh, it's been a tremendous amount of work from people like Kevin and, and, and the community leaders uh, to get this to you guys today. And, and, and I think collectively we would love to ask, that there's gonna be a lot of other towns and, and, and um, smaller communities applying for this. We wanna make sure that we had everything going, getting to you guys as fast as possible so we can continue that pace to get this to that next phase because the recruitment and the job offer process is still gonna take a few months. So what we didn't wanna do is, is have this kind of stuck here uh, or not get in front of you guys for six more months and then by the time the workers get here, we've lost the summer, we're at the end of the year. And, and, and so the urgency is definitely something that we would love for, and we're happy to support in, in any way that we can. 
All right, thanks for that, Usman. So there's a lot of benefits to the community in using this program. This will give every business in town that uses non-skilled workers a pipeline of talent to come here. And I mean, right now, it's just that right now, that's just not available to us. But this will give us a, a, a pipeline of, of people to work. One of the biggest things on this list is that I think is Strathmore could become recognized as an AAIP community. So if you have a business in the future that's looking around and poking around in southern Alberta trying to decide where to build a business, they're going to ask, is this an AAIP community? Do I have a pipeline of employees here? And if we are, if we have it, it'll give us a leg up and it'll be a building block of a strong economy. All right. So, so there's a number of things that we're going to have to get in place. One of them is we've got to form a committee that's going to administer this. Um, there's a number of steps in the application that we need to uh, address. One of them is an economic development plan. We have to have a recruitment strategy. This is on a municipal level, and we have to uh, have identified gaps and opportunities in, in our labor market. And then the other one is a settlement plan and collaboration, and Rocky View County has a settlement service that we partner with, right, that looks after Strathmore. So the, what we're looking for is we're looking for some support and we're looking for the, the, the town to play a leadership role in this and to, to take this on as a project and to go ahead and, and uh, we're looking for you to make, go ahead and make an, make an application to start the process. Does anyone have any questions so far? Thank you. Uh, and Kevin, in our meeting that we had in my office, right. I, I think you said it is like a labor pool then that you draw from. And then would the committee then go through the list of people to try to find someone that would match us? Is that how it works? Well, from my understanding, the way it would work is we're going to decide if we, want, if we need to, to bring some foreign workers here. We will, on our own, work with recruiters in other countries that will bring forward people that we can nominate into the process. They're going to go on to the AAIP portal. They're going to identify that um, they're, they're from another country. They want to work in rural Alberta, and they want to work in Strathmore, and they want to work for one of us. And then it would be up to us to provide a job offer to match that, and then it would be up for the, the committee to support it. Okay, thank you. Um, and how many do you think would be on the committee, and, and who do you envision being a part of that committee from the town's point of view? Well, I would think someone from your administration would be on it, probably someone from the Chamber of Commerce, and maybe your economic development officer. That would okay. be a good round out of people with different interests in it. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions from councillors? Deputy Mayor Montgomery. Yeah, I got a few questions, but I'll, I'll ask a couple right now. Um, how long are the workers obligated to remain with the initial business? Not long. So when they come to Canada, they're going to have a, a, a provincial nomination right away. So that's going to come with their ticket. So right away they can initiate their permanent residency application. And as soon as they get that, they can, they can move on. So it's probably, realistically, it's going to be about 18 months. 18 months to two years. When they come here, one of the final, when they do get a work permit issued to them, it'll be for two years. Okay, and so if they didn't want to remain with that particular business, they would be sent back out of the country? No. This is an immigration program, not a temporary foreign worker program. So no one's, no one's going home. I, I'm just wondering, like, so you said currently, like, with the, the, the PR system, somebody can show up and then they can just go find another job somewhere else and... Not, so with the current system right now, we use a LMIA system, Labor Market Impact Assessment. And when that person comes to Canada, they're, they're tied to the business for the two years. 
So, uh, if, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, if I can explain. So the, the, this, the current foreign worker coming to Canada comes in with a labor market impact assessment with no guarantee that they're getting permanent residency. So when they show up here, they're inclined to find, so, so typically a low skill worker is not eligible to become a permanent resident and permanently stay in Canada. They would come, they'd work two years, and they'd be obligated to go back home. And the program was designed so that if you stayed here for the two years, you, you serviced a need and then you left. Um, and and the, Canada had said a low skill worker has no place to receive a permanent residency application. Like we don't need this person to stay in Canada. Um, so when the worker shows up here, they're looking for a management position somewhere else. They're looking for anything that gets them a semi-skilled to a skilled position where they could apply for PR, which is why they're always looking for any way desperately to stay. What this program does is it removes that fear. So, the, so in my opinion, if you are hiring somebody through this stream, they're going to be inclined to stay in the community that they're, they're getting this offer from because, first of all, they're tied to the town that they're coming to and, and the employer for the duration of their work permit. Um, and at the end, they'll have some level of connection to it, right, versus them coming here and saying, I, I'm just coming here for uh, uh, an access to Canada and then I can go and get a job somewhere else that can get me PR. We are offering them the ability while they're in their home country to say, you can come to Canada and become a permanent resident and Strathmore is doing this for you and, and the business is doing this for you. And that's a completely different conversation from a recruitment perspective um, versus what we have today. It, it, it's a lot more temporary in its nature versus what this program could potentially do for stability. So I, I would argue that a lot more employees are gonna be inclined to integrate into the community because they'll be coming, they'll have their PR kind of guaranteed uh, through the nomination program um, and then when they get that nomination program, they'll have realized what we've done from beginning to end, from a business perspective, from a town perspective. So I think they integrate a lot better into the town versus the program that we have today, which has a shorter work permit and no guarantee for PR. So that person likes to be a bit more of a flight risk, if that answers your, your question. Okay. Um, and so under this particular program, if somebody, you know, comes and they, you know, get a job offer, you know, somewhere else right away. What is, like, they're obviously, they can't go take that job is what you're saying? No, I, I think the program, they, because it has the nomination certificate, yeah. th that nomination certificate means that the Alberta government is nominating them to become a permanent resident. So I believe the Alberta government has something like 6,000 nominations a year. So like a, the federal government brings in 200, 300,000 people. Alberta government has 6,000. Of that 6,000, Alberta government has decided to come up with this program for however many number of employees uh, get through it. So they will be definitely tied to, so when, they, when the, when the uh, application goes to the PR officer in Ottawa or, or wherever it's going, they'll have to demonstrate that they're meeting the conditions of their nomination certificate, which is working in rural Alberta slash Strathmore. Um, and then they can get their PR. After they get their PR, they're free to move around just like anybody else would. But, but I'm arguing that I think that they would likely stay because of, they, they'd be integrated a lot better. They, they, they'd have found home, they'd have found schools, they would have um, definitely, I think, the much higher likelihood that these people stay in Strathmore and, and continue to play an active role in the labor environment versus the, the program that we have today, which has no local control whatsoever. Okay, so under this program, if they didn't want to stick with that business, they would get sent back home? Uh, they would lose their nomination certificate. I'm not sure about the what would happen with their permit or what what the how the federal government would view their status here, um, but they would not be eligible to apply for PR. But I, I think it would be highly unlikely for somebody to come here with a guaranteed nomination certificate and leave. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Peterson. Thank you, Worship. I, I'm referencing page seven of 51 on, on our project, the, the first page of, uh, of the uh, AAIP with the arrows flowing down. In terms of relationship, so um, in experience in this community, would, would people be able to sponsor family under this program? I think if they met the conditions of the AAIP? I think as long as they met the conditions that were listed in, in the, uh, on the website, they probably would be able to. And, and so in this particular case, um, persons 
making application uh, can be refugee. I'm, I'm understanding. They yeah. Yes. Uh, refugee. So that, I think you'd have to refer to an immigration expert. So this would be. I'm not sure about the refugees. The, so the reason I'm asking the question is that in the second last arrow, it says foreign national applies to immigration, refugees, and citizenship Canada for permanent residency. Right. So I understand that context, but it's a bit misleading because, as you said, I'm not sure that refugees... Yeah. So the, the department is called Immigration, Refugee, Citizenship I know, Canada. I know. So I, I, I think the refugee would be a completely separate... Um, Workflow, we'd have to speak with an immigration expert. If we wanted to recruit a refugee, th they would already have a work permit uh, to, to, to operate in. in uh, if they get their refugee status, they're able to work in Canada. So we wouldn't need to bring them through a stream. So, so of course, you know what I'm talking about. I'm yeah. talking about Syria, Afghanistan, yeah. Ukraine, where we have huge interest. Um, so... I was looking at the AAIP website today, and there's a banner at the top that says the Ukrainian refugees will have priority in the program. Right. Right. And and I and I understood when I spoke to, to some of the federal offices that, that um, Afghanistan may also, uh, they have some prioritization federally. Right. Yeah, on the entire immigration stream for sure. Yeah, they're getting fast tracked. And of course, we're still behind, on the promises made to Syria as well. So possibly them as well. And then, so, so that, that's a question for me because that's, that's an important consideration, that sure. refugee piece. Sure. Um, the other thing is, um, is with regards to, in, in terms of, so, so if you are hiring someone in, uh, into Tim Hortons or, or McDonald's, for instance, yeah. And, um, and they decided, so they were still working, uh, they have to stay in that space. They can't move outside that space. Right. Okay. Until they get their permanent residency. Right. Which is fast track because they show up with their nomination certificate versus like a, getting a nomination certificate today uh, in Alberta is impossible. For a low-skilled worker, A, for a semi-skilled worker, they've probably got 35,000 applications and they can only authorize 6,000 uh, a year. Uh, I, have, I have way more experience than I ever want with, uh, with Immigration Canada. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, of semi-skilled and skilled workers, this still applies, correct? No, this is, this is, this is low only low-skilled. Low low yeah. All right. A semi-skilled and skilled has the ability to um, right, apply for Right, under foreign workers, right, under, yeah. the foreign, under the existing foreign workers. Yes. Yeah. They don't need a nomination certificate. They can apply with the point system. Thank you. I, I also just want to say to all of you here and your supporters that uh, you've been uh, amazing corporate citizens. We don't get to say that enough in the community and Thank you. Thank you what much. you've all Appreciate offered. That. Um, uh, um, been extraordinary, all of Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for administration. Um, since this could involve the creation of a committee w involving our staff, would this need to come to you at a council meeting through a motion? We would, be, would we bring it back to the next council meeting? Or, do you, or are you good to, with just direction from council? Uh, through the, to the chair, we could just bring it back. We're actually already doing some informal work on this, so I mean, we can bring it back, and you can look at it then and formalize it if you like. So. Okay. And do you think that would come to us as of the twentieth of April? Because you you folks were saying time is of the essence. Right. I know that puts a lot of stress and strain on your mm -hmm. staff too. To, and I hate to put you on the spot like this. Uh, I think we need a bit more time in that, but I mean, we can certainly work with the delegates tonight to share where we're at, and that might still fit in their timelines. But in terms of, you know, getting a significant program going, we need need more than a week. So, okay, uh, Kevin. 
Yeah, one more thing. We do have eight letters of support from businesses in town, uh, seven restaurants and one hotel. So I wanted to pass that along to council as well. Uh, do you need a letter of support from mayor and council for something like this or we, just creation of the committee? We, we will for the application. When, when, we make the, when the municipality makes the application to the provincial government, we'll need a letter of support from council. Okay, thank you. And just so I can wrap my head around the concept on a large scale, uh, in the bigger picture, is, is, the re is the reason we need something like this because we can't get enough lower skilled people from our town to fill the positions you need? Yes, that's okay. exactly correct. Okay, that's interesting. Hmm. All right, um, I have Councillor Langmead and then uh, Councillor Mayor Montgomery. Councillor Langmead, you're up. Thank you very much. I just have a couple of questions. Uh, I, I know this is early in the process and no one has hard numbers right now, so I'm not expecting a hard number that I would hold anyone to, but uh, do you have kind of an idea of how many people we would be looking to welcome into our community? Well, we have the eight letters of support. So there was eight businesses that were willing to put up their hand and say that if this program was here, we would use it. So... At least eight. Well, at least eight <laughs> businesses with multiple... I mean, gosh, I would bet you would have 100 applications a year in that book. Kind of, I'm just guessing. Yeah, that, that, that kind of that's a ballpark. That's what I was going to say, yeah, about 100. But that's just a guess. Okay, and then um, the other question I have is, uh, do the people, do, do the businesses putting the applications forward, do you go through any process of that these folks will have housing set well, when they get, you know, uh, that, that's kind of what I'm thinking is, you know, someone landing in town first thing on their feet, will we have, will we be able to house them and things like that? So when we, when we bring people here, we have a responsibility as an employer to ensure they have adequate housing. And part of the application that the municipality will make is there's a component in there of ensuring that there's appropriate housing available in town for them. Okay. It's actually one of the hurdles we're going to have to hurdle with the application. And it, it's one of the things that, um, as I was saying, it, it, it further bonds the community. It's the first time where we have the potential of working directly with the town, uh, you know, in a, in a partnership way to, to integrate these, call it 100 people, uh, over the course of, of, of the duration. And, and, and I think by putting that best foot forward of letting this person know that you're here because the business needs you and the community needs you, and here's all the supports that are in place to make sure that all of us have come together to help you find adequate housing and, and all those things. It, it, it really makes this person feel connected to the community, and I, and I would argue that it makes them harder for them to want to, to leave uh, at the end of their, their PR. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely, thank you. I was you know, just thinking, thinking yeah. forward, making sure we don't, we don't want to bring someone here and have them get here and find out, oh, there's nothing to no way sure. to live. Where are we going to stay? Yeah. Uh, you know, always, always just a consideration, especially when rent isn't cheap these days, and and you want to make sure that the people coming, we're welcoming here, can. Yeah, sure. I, I want them to come in. I want them to come and stay in our community. I want them to be successful here, and that was just the basis of the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could just echo uh, Councillor Peterson's earlier comments and some of Councillor Langmaid's. Um, these businesses that are here in town and you folks represent them here, uh, I've been so impressed over the years how much you've supported schools and, and other charitable events. So we've, we've come through this COVID situation where the service industry has really, really been hit hard. And so if we can do something to help support it, I'm, I'm behind this. I think um, collaboration to me has been the key to a lot of things from building capital projects to land development to, to supporting our businesses in town. And I think this is a really good thing. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peterson. Thank you very much, Your Worship. I was just going back to the whole idea of accommodations, and I know, so this is where you would work through the settlement plan um, with Rocky View County that they have in yeah. existence, and right. it is a huge concern. I had a conversation with Belinda some months ago um, when they were looking for, for people in the community and that they're finding accommodation, as Councillor Langmaid mentioned, is extraordinarily difficult. I spend some of my time with uh, with the overnight shelter and you know never in our wildest dreams did we expect that the overnight shelter 
would be the place where people would come to uh, gain accommodation because they couldn't find, you know, these are people fully employed who'd moved to community, couldn't find places to live. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was interesting how synergies happen in that environment, you know, four or five people coming together, working in, in, uh, in jobs that would, uh, you know, then find spaces. But it was, ex it's extraordinarily difficult. And prior, you know, prior to that, and I, and I don't see it as being a, a downfall to this, but I do see it as being a bigger challenge than the AAIP program. And, and I would welcome ideas, you know, and, um, you know, I know, th I know of businesses that have actually, uh, that own property that, where they, uh, where they rent to employees. But uh, I think that uh, when, when I was involved in the periphery, when we were sponsoring the Syrian refugees, accommodation was the biggest single problem. It wasn't undoable, but it was in a different environment than we have now, and it was uh, singularly difficult. Um, but uh, if you have ideas around that, I'd be, I'd be very, very interested to hear them. Yeah, and I know collectively, like, you know, we want this to be a success. So I, I know that we'll all come to the table when it comes to finding a collective solution around um, finding uh, housing or, or whatever supports that these people will need. Because I think it's, it, it's for the betterment of the service that we're able to provide and, and also for these people to, to come in and be able to feel like they're, they're connected. So absolutely, I think we'll, we'll always be at the table willing to, to help out and share uh, some best bets around what we've learned from, from the community, from our lens, for sure. Your Worship, from an experiential perspective, I, I think that that is, it is a critical factor because we know what's happened in Southern Ontario with crowding and overcrowding with, mm -hmm. with uh, migrant communities uh, where it's caused enormous difficulties in, in community and, and in reputational process of programming. Banff, too, you know, with, with well, uh, seasonal when, workers. When we get to that part of the process, our, our businesses, we have to stand up to audit. With, yes, I understand that. Absolutely. Right, so we have a responsibility to make sure that we'll, we'll do our part to make sure they have proper housing. We have a responsibility to do that. Thank you. And it's kind of good timing tonight. We are also going to be discussing finding ways for housing with the garden and garage suite options that are concepts that we're thinking about discussing. Uh, Deputy Mayor Montgomery. <clears throat> um, thank you. Uh, so I have a question for administration, and that is um, how much do we have budgeted for this? And I'm guessing the answer is we don't have money budgeted for this. Um, so I, I would need to know exactly or roughly how much this was going to cost per year to implement. Um, that's, that's kind of a, a big stick for me. Um, I, you know, I used to own and operate a construction business. I hired low skill, medium skill, and high skilled people. I, I know the position you're in. Um, and, but I, I'm also in charge of, well, partially in charge of the, the, the taxpayers' money here. Yeah. And, and so I, I honestly have concerns about uh, taxpayer money being used uh, to, um, well, you know, I'll, 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 I'll refer to one of the slides that's in this presentation, actually, and um, on... Uh, I guess it's page 18 of 51 in our agenda. Um, you know, it mentions like the impacts to businesses and communities, and one of the impacts um, <laughs> is, uh, you know, of a labor shortage, obviously, and low unemployment rate is, is higher wages and, and benefits. And you know, to most people, that's obviously a positive thing. Obviously, I, I understand for a business that's that's a big cost. Um, I. I and so I, I, you know, I, I have a hard time as somebody in, in the driver's seat of, of, a, of a municipal government, um, you know, saying, hey, you know, we should be taking action to lower, you know, keep wages down and make sure, you know, benefits are down, especially for low-skilled people. Um, I, I, I have, you know, written down the same concern about uh, housing. You know, our, our, our rental market is obviously already incredibly tight. Um, you know, bringing 100 more people in is going to exacerbate that problem. Um, it's actually going to hurt, you know, the kind of the, the lower skilled people that are in the community already, um, you know, using their own tax dollars essentially against them. Um, so I, I have that concern. Um, 
sorry, did, did you want to say something? Sure. I don't, I don't think, you know, I, we recognize this is a pretty big project for the municipality. And it's not, a, it's not simple and it's going to take some effort and it's going to take, it's going to cost some money. But, I mean, put a user fee on it. I mean, we, we're not looking for a handout here. We'll, we'll pay our part to, to uh, make sure this is revenue neutral for the, for the town. Okay. Um, I mean, no, I'll yeah. also add the, 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 the situation we're in now, particularly post-COVID, is there's a lack of availability. I, I don't think there's any of us that haven't shied away from increasing wages, increasing benefits. We've had to do that, particularly in the pandemic, in ways that I've been in business for 15 years, and the wages that we're paying now are exponentially higher than we've paid before. But that doesn't change the fact that in the last 10 days, I've had zero applications. And I've had maybe 14 people view the ad. There's just no people to, to apply for the positions that we have. Uh, and in addition to the, the program would not put a limit on curbing wages. The, the, you know, most of the foreign workers coming in now are getting paid a prevailing wage, which is um, a, a snapshot of what the town is paying in any given moment. So, so you, you're coming in at market value. You're not, you're not going to go into the program heavier because you're getting a lower wage person. You're going to only use the program if there's no people uh, around to, to show up. And, and then the last comment is, uh, I, I think all of us want to keep our taxes down and all of us want a highly efficient municipality so that our taxes uh, stay down. Um, I, I do think that there's a net benefit here of, 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 in, of bringing in people whose kids are going to go to school here, whose kids are going to be tied to this town, and at the same time, the more revenue that we're able to generate, the more work we're going to be able to do in the, in the community. And what we're facing now is a situation where, without the availability of labor, there's potential service things that may not be able to, we, we're, not, we're not going to be able to offer. Like my, my late night today, if, if I don't have somebody show up, somebody from Calgary is driving in. And that works in very moderate weather. If it's a cold winter, we're not going to get a restaurant open at night. And, and we, we, none of us want to go back to that situation. Um, so we're looking for this program to be a, a last resort to help uh, the, the low skill side. We, we've got the supports on the other side and, and we're continuing to find ways to engage. I, I know all of us work with the, the local schools to hire as many kids as we possibly can. To, to hire anybody with a limited availability, but we do operate 24-7. Um, we do operate in, in areas where, you know, if a, if a fire truck is going out on a call at 2 o'clock, they can stop and get a burger and coffee on their way back. Yeah. Um, and we want to make sure we're able to continue to offer that uh, year-round. Uh, and and the, the accessibility to labor is proving to be a major challenge, particularly now, particularly post-pandemic. Thanks. Yeah, and like I, I actually, you know, I understand how even like government has, you know, caused some of the problems that you're experiencing. I, I understand that. Um, I, I just have I have concerns about the program as it is. I'll I'll get more information, I guess, from administration, and uh, I'll, I'll make a decision based on that. So thank you very much for answering my questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just a quick question before I go to Councillor Peterson to administration: Would this be mainly staff time that would be the expense of our municipality if we were involved in this program? I think what we'll do is we'll take this away and we'll bring back like a, a comprehensive report that will include any any cost. So let us let us kind of take that away and make sure that uh, we answered uh, Councillor Montgomery's question and, and any other questions that Council has. If you have specific items you want us to address in the report back, just, just let me know. Okay, thank you. Councillor Peterson. Thank you, Richard. I, I know that this is an economic development boost to our community. It's an advantage across the board. I, I, completely um, agree with you. The other, the other um, potential conflict that I see coming forward, and I, I want to address it here because I know it'll come to council sooner or later, and the question will be, you know, when we have an, um, a, a community that is our neighbor and our partner in Siksika that struggles sometimes with uh, issues of employment, that that may come to us. Why, why, aren't you, why aren't you seeking out support there? And I just want to acknowledge the fact that all of you have done an extraordinary work with that, with Siksika and with Siksika um, employment and training. And I, 
I know that you do, and particularly I, I know the Roadhouse, uh, this, and uh, I've had lots of students there, and Osman with you as well. And so I really want to commend you for that and, um, and say that that is not uh, an abiding issue in this case, that, uh, that you um, have uh, gone well into that uh, labor market as well, and I'm really appreciative of that and, uh, and acknowledge it here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Peterson. Councillor Wiley. I just want to echo the support you guys have been hearing all night. This sounds like a really interesting idea, and I look forward to administration bringing back in a very timely manner more information on this. And uh, thank you so much for coming. I'll let Pat do the closing remarks. Thanks, Councillor Wiley. So our next steps, we know that ledge services and uh, administration are going to be on this, and then you'll come back to us with a report. Uh, I want to thank you, Kevin and Usman, for being here tonight. All the businesses who sent representatives here. Uh, again, thank you for all you do in the community to support our residents and young people, teenagers, uh, employees who come to you probably lately more on part-time basis. And, and I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how this can help, uh, help our businesses in town. Thank you. And that brings us to item four, confirmation of minutes 4.1, Committee of the Whole Meeting Minutes for March 9th, 2022. Councillor Peterson. Your Worship, I move the Council adopt the March 9th, 2022 Committee of the Whole Meeting Minutes as presented. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor, so I'll call the question. All in favor? And the motion is carried. That brings us to item five, business 5.1, Urban Hen Bylaw number 22-08. Good evening, Claudette, and welcome. Good evening, Your Worship and Councillors. I don't know where to start. <laughs> this bylaw has been nesting for a bit, but I'm here to crack it. <laughs> I researched some other communities, and I didn't, didn't just pull it together without choosing the most extremely important sections. Tried to put many eggs into my basket for this bylaw and not just wing it. I'm done being a committee hen and happy to answer any questions you may have about the bylaw. <laughs> Thank you for that, for bringing a little bit of a light touch to this issue. Um, I, I think I had a question that you answered uh, via e an email through our CAO. Um, basically, um, there, is, there has been a small group that's approached uh, our, our uh, staff about this. Yes, there has been. There's been, I'd say about a dozen. <laughs> Perfect size for eggs, too, is a dozen. <laughs> okay, so a dozen have come forward. Is there any chance that they would want to come to us as a delegation at some point? Do we want a, a hen party? Certainly would come as a delegation and not in a hen envelope. Um, <laughs> There actually has been quite support. Um, I know a few members that I've passed on their emails to you or forwarded them on, um, asking them to reach out. They're willing to come here. There's a, there's a strong support in the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Montgomery and then Councillor Wiley. Um, and thanks for the puns. I always like puns. <laughs> um, so actually, like, so I sent an email asking about quails and ducks, and you gave a fairly comprehensive answer. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just talking about why we might not want to allow quails or ducks, please. So quails require a lot of ventilation. They are smaller birds and would be able to reside and be cooped up with the dimensions of the chickens. However, um, their droppings, I guess, have a lot of, it's a strong ammonia smell, which can create respiratory issues. So I'm not sure that would be great for Strathmore residents. Uh, ducks, did you want? Sorry, do you mean they cause the respiratory issues for the, the quails or for the, the people? For the people. Oh, okay. I think yeah. The quails, okay. Sorry, yeah, go ahead about the ducks. Yeah, no, so the ducks uh, require 
little bit more space than an average backyard. They require water. They're more, they're a bird who wants to be on the ground, not really nesting up high, so they can't really be locked away from predators as much. They need to be wet. Um, swimming, obviously, they have webbed feet. They're on the water a lot. They need water for their food, and they also need enough water to submerge their head, followed by their body. And also, they need the water to clean out their nostrils. So water is a huge, I guess, asset for them to, be, to reside and live. Strathmore is not really a community with a lot of water and backyards. Yeah, I was going to say, like, basically you're saying most people's backyards would not be conducive to ducks. Okay. Um, this will ask one more question. Um, is a fenced backyard considered secured? As far as, like, they have to be secured during the daytime? Um, so would that be secured? No. Okay. You have to use chicken wire to secure it. But you're saying like so it has to be like enclosed like the roof has to be enclosed itself or is um, okay. yeah so under coop it it has to be fully enclosed you need a little coop run area for the chicken and also a nesting space for the chicken okay. and and so the coop run has to have a, a roof is what you're saying yes okay all right uh, I'll, I'll pass it along to Councillor Wiley thank you Councillor Wiley, I just had some sub specific questions in the bylaw, so I'm looking at uh, section five, section 5.1E, which is on page 34. Yes. I think I was following everything in the bylaw up to this, and it said that there needs to be evidence that the proposed hen keeper has experience or training in hen keeping. Is that a certification a person needs, or how do you prove that? Yeah, that's correct. And actually, I'm glad you asked that question. I've reached out to, I guess it's a group in Calgary or just outside. They put on these urban hen courses. It's kind of like Chicken 101, and you just sign up. So I have a meeting with them tomorrow just to gather more information. Shall this come back to council? And they base it's all the information that you need to know going into what your roles and responsibility is. So it's easier to enforce rather than saying, I had no idea what I was getting into. Now we're left with these random chickens, foul play, everything. So we need it to... Just keeps um, going, doesn't it? <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> this is... <laughs> So, <laughs> so yes, they would need to provide some kind of certificate or proof of, say, being with a farmer and understanding the full Yeah, because that's what I wonder is just previous experience with hens. Like, so we'd be fairly lenient. It's not like there's a certified body of hen keeping association that you must go through this or? No, they just have to provide, I guess, proof that they know what they're getting into. Yeah, so that's the only one that's a little vague for me. And then um, my next one was 6.5 on page 36. I love the Hen P Appeal Committee. Are these paid employees? Like, is there a cost associated with this appeal committee? Or are people going to actually volunteer to sit on the appeal committee? There, there was, it said, an experienced... A lawyer or a lawyer with expertise uh, I think it even said something about a veterinarian like these obviously would be people who once a year I'm assuming would have to get together and visa these appeals and then they would be paid or just during normal op business hours maybe we could get together and I think it would be fun for them but I mean that's something <laughs> we would have to ask them okay so there might be some costs associated with that there might be but which also comes, be I mean, it's not a lot of revenue being generated from the hens, but there is a hen license fee that could yeah, assist so with those. My, my final question. Um, I quite like this bylaw. I thought it was very interesting. I don't think we'll have a tremendous number of people applying. But when I got to the cost on page 43, um, it seemed to me that this fee makes the hen bylaw a lose-lose situation 
those opposed to the backyard hens will be angry that we allowed backyard hens and those in favor will I think find this totally unaffordable. So four hens is $200. So it's $50 a hen for $200 for four. Is there some way we could have, I mean, obviously the rest of council will need to weigh in on this, but some way that you'd go, I don't know, $50 for one hen and, and 10 for every additional hen or something like that. Like the fee just seems completely insurmountable. And that's an annual fee, just for anyone listening. That's, it's $50 annually per hen, up to four hens, $200 an annual fee. So I guess where did, the, where did that price come from? Does that just cover expenses? Where, what, what's the thinking behind that? The fee, looking at other bylaws, is kind of in line. And I would say, I should have wrote it down where the other municipalities were at, but it's near like the middle lower end. But I guess that's up to council. What would you see that's appropriate? The fee, this isn't set. It was just kind of a gauge from other municipalities. Sorry, and can I just ask, that's, that's $50 per hen? Could do $50 per hen or $50 a hen license. Okay, but if you want to be a hen keeper, you could. There's two ways you could do it. Did you have a question, or were you voting? We don't <laughs> normally vote. No, it. Your Worship. I believe the the bylaws written that it's fifty dollars for the license, and that includes you can have four hens up to, for a maximum of it. It's not fifty dollars per hen. That was my interpretation. Unless council wishes to to go a different direction, it there is. There's the, the 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 license of the of the hen, like a dog license or anything like that, and then there's penalties associated with that. Thank you, Mark. Is is there a reason why we wouldn't charge that per hen? As if you had like three dogs, three hens, is it is it too prohibitive? Then is that okay? I, I, Your Worship, I think it's in line with other, as as Claude had indicated, right majority of the municipalities that we surveyed have a, a standard license for it for the for the hens okay um, again if council chooses to to say um you know but my i guess think our recommendation would be to maintain this as it's consistent with other municipalities and does make it um you know obviously hens are would be a i think a less of a nuisance than a dog than one dog or two dogs and that's why there's be multiple licenses for um those animals versus this one. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Has this been successful in other communities? Uh, is it working? I haven't followed it very closely. I spoke to one gentleman who is experienced in having backyard chickens, and there was no complaints from the neighbor. I haven't read any complaints of even like pilot projects. I think it was Innisfail did a two-year pilot project. I could be wrong but I didn't see any issues come out of it. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Peterson Councilor and then... Councillor Langmaid and then Councillor Peterson. Thank you. I just have a couple of quick questions. Uh, well, one quick question, and then I, I just want to uh, kind of bump up what Councillor Wiley said and add to it is, is just the... I, I, I would like to see a definition of that what training is acceptable and you know is it is that a course uh, how do we how do we assess previous experience if you grew up with chickens is that enough how do we prove that do you need to bring a polaroid just those kind of questions and i'm not expecting you to have an answer right now it's just the comment is i i would like to see that just tightened up a bit so that we can ensure that it's a fitting the needs that we need so that nobody's I mean, we only have frozen chickens in the freezer, not outside in the coops is the big things. Like, I want to make sure people know how to take care of these animals in the winter because, you know, chickens at minus 40. I, I haven't had chickens myself. I imagine they get cold. Uh, <laughs> so just things like that. Uh, that's something that is that I'll be looking for when it comes in front of us. The other question I have is, uh, why 16 weeks? Why 16-week-old why chickens and not brand-new hatch-them-yourself chickens? Of two different, I guess, answers I can provide. From doing some research, it seems like a, there's many families around Easter time who are gung ho about getting these baby chicks. And the survival rate as they get older, 
isn't as, I guess, consistent as if you get them at 16 weeks. Kids lose interest in them, they're not as cute, right? Um, so the four week, or sorry, the four month chickens are more, I guess, set up to survive by that time. Okay, I, I understand. I guess uh, the reason why I'm asking is I can see this being a very popular homeschool activity, uh, something that parents do to teach kids. And I think a part of that that would lessen would, would be right, hatching the chicks. Because I, I, you know, uh, you see that happen in classrooms and things, and they'll incubate chickens and things like that. So it's just something that I'm, I'm wondering. It, I understand I don't want any of the chickens not, not to make it, but at the same time, oh, would people be happy getting? I, I, I had to Google what a 16-week-old chicken looks like. That thing ain't cute. Like, it is not. It, it doesn't have all of its feathers. It is not a cute bird. <laughs> uh, so you must really want a chicken if you're getting one that looks like that. But um, just, uh, just some, it's something I'm thinking of that I'll have to talk to people in the community and just kind of say, hey, how would you feel about getting a scrappy teenager chicken instead of, you know, a cute baby fluffy one? Just thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go now to Councillor Peterson and then Deputy Mayor Montgomery. In previous, uh, thank you, Worship, in previous conversations that we've had informally around this, this uh, issue, um, one of the questions that came up was how backyard chickens are impacted by outbreaks of avian flu. And two days ago, the front page, one of the front page headlines in the Calgary Herald read, 160,000 farm birds dead and destroyed as avian flu sweeps through Alberta. And I, re I remember during that time there was, there was um, some research presented that backyard chickens are not as vulnerable to avian flu as large, in dense chicken populations. But it is something that, that I'd be interested in in the future. You know, if, if, there, if there's this huge outbreak in Alberta, how would that impact a, a community, you know, or would it impact a community? What are the chances and how would we how would we know and how would we um, utilize bylaw to oversee it if, if it did happen? That, that's a, a concern that I have. And, and the other question I have is what, what would a school wanted to undertake um, a backyard chicken project? Would there be a different uh, licensing context for, for a school that would, may want to do this? I could certainly explore it. I'm open to options. It's a great idea. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Montgomery. Thank you. Um, so I just like I have a correction, I guess. Um, Seven point two e. Uh, it says, and um, I think it probably should be any for uh, for that. Um, Through your worship, Council Montgomery, did you say D? Seven point two D. E, please. It just says to prevent and rodent. Um, I'm assuming that's prevent any rodent or rodents. We've taken note of that. You're right. It should be an an typo. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so I guess like I'm, I would like to make a comment in general. Um, I've noticed like there's a trend towards uh, with bylaws, like almost like micromanaging um, people. And, and I totally get that where there's, you know, a safety issue, like, uh, you know, with bees, for instance, you know, we want to make sure that people are not going to have bees kind of flying around stinging people, et cetera. Um, but I, I think that there's, like, you know, as, as far as, like, you know, your point about the, the younger chicks, um, I don't see how it's necessarily the town of Strathmore's problem if, if somebody gets some younger chicks and they, they don't survive or, you know, they're... Um, you know, they're kind of, uh, that's that's not exactly, you know, the problem, I don't think, of the, the municipality. Um, or, you know, like we're saying, you know, we're, we're telling people to store their feed in a, in a you know, a certain container. And I, I don't see how it's our, our problem, I guess, to, you know, if somebody's storing feed in a bag or if somebody's storing feed in a, you know, a garbage can or something like that. Um, and... 
you know, I, I get that there's, you know, there's kind of best practices that we could, you know, try to communicate. And I, I feel like that would almost be a better thing to include in like a, like an information package, you know, like, hey, here's some things you might want to do rather than like, you know, we said they must, you know, like they, you know, so somebody gets a bag of feed, you know, and we're saying you must transfer that into a, 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 a certain type of container. And, and there's not a threat of a fine, obviously, but it, it, it just strikes me as kind of strange that we would, we would do that, um, you know, and we don't kind of say, okay, you gotta, you know, you gotta walk your dog, you know, this far every day, or, you know, you have to provide, you know, water to your dog or water to your cat. Um, so I, it's, I, I just, you know, I find it, I, I would personally prefer if we kind of got away from micro, like micromanaging people in, in, in bylaws. Um, there's, you know, we wanna, we wanna limit um, people negatively affecting their neighbors, for instance. That's, that's, you know, that's our job is to, you know, not have one neighbor kind of negatively affecting the other. But I think if somebody wants to, you know, store their feed in a, you know, a less than ideal container, I don't see why that's, you know, kind of our place to have an opinion. Um, so I, I guess like, yeah, it's just a kind of a general comment for administration that, um, you know, we should, unless it's the will of council, you know, and, and part of the problem is like, you know, I, you, I understand like you work on these bylaws and you know, you, you do a good job, you know, you put together a comprehensive bylaw, but then it's up to me to all of a sudden come and, and argue against all these things that, you know, in my opinion, shouldn't be in the bylaw. And maybe it should be the other way around where, you know, if a council counselor feels that, you know, hey, it's really important to me that, you know, like this, feed be in a certain container, you know, maybe it should be up to them to, to argue the point of why it should be in a certain container, rather than me having to argue about why, you know, why are we putting this in here? Um, and so I, I, maybe that's, you know, for a larger discussion, but um, yeah, and I, I don't want to, you know, I, I understand you work, you work hard on these and you do a good job. Um, so my, my, it's more of a philosophical thing for me, maybe, but um, part of the problem is, is that when we put something into a law, you know, then it's, um, it is law, you know, as so we have to be, I, I believe we have to be judicious about the things that we take an opinion on through law, because we should only be taking an opinion on things that are, you know, important enough to actually take an opinion on. Um, and, you know, for example, the feed one in a certain container, it's probably not important enough. Like if somebody calls bylaw and says, hey, my neighbor's got, you know, feed in a, a bag, you know, are we gonna send bylaw out there to kind of give them a hard time? Probably not, I would hope not, but then, you know, why is it in the bylaw, right, so? I can maybe provide some context on why it would not be stored in the bag and in a actual well, no, sealable I, I, container. You're having rodents yeah. come in, you have stray cats out and about, you have feed everywhere, there goes a waste of your money. No, I, to I, I totally get why it's a better way to do it, but I'm just saying if somebody wants to waste their money on, on feed going bad or feed getting you know, eaten by rodents or whatever, they want to attract mice or they, they're just not very careful, to me that's not really like the town's problem, that's that, that's that individual's problem and, and it's, you know, could, the, maybe the I could. government is going to be here to basically, you know, say, okay, you got to tie your shoes, for instance, you know, like we're, we're kind of getting to the point where we are trying to save people trouble, but is it really our job to be saving people from that trouble, essentially? Um, and that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't believe it is. I think if I could add something, I, if we're going to do this um, bylaw for backyard hens, I want it to be something, my own feeling is I want it to be something that's going to be successful for, for the people in their backyards. And if, if, uh, if they don't use the proper receptacle, and I'm sure some of the stuff would come from this guide to hen owning fowl, your, fair, your feathered friends. Um, if they were to use a bag, for example, I don't know if it's, it's something that the neighbor would complain, but if it's attracting rodents, that becomes a huge problem now for my next door neighbor if I've if I've not done a good job of taking care of these. Uh, the other thing, the other thing is, um, if the 16 week old chicken, I can't believe I'm discussing chicken so much. If a 16 week old chicken has is more viable to live, then that I think it's almost incumbent upon us to make sure there aren't dead chicks all over backyards. We want to make sure that they're going to be successful again. And sometimes you need 
kind of stronger wording to ensure that people are going to be successful, but there also aren't going to be more problems coming from backyard chicken. Yeah, feral, and we have to have a happy chicken society after, with feral chickens running everywhere, and gangs bullying other fowl. <sighs> leather coats, little leather coats. <laughs> Mark, help me. Uh, uh, I think you're down the right line, though, Your Worship. Ultimately, this bylaw takes in some best practices, but ultimately it, it, it tries to educate and inform um, citizens and residents of um, of good practices, good ownership on, on how to ensure, um, you know, that these animals and ultimately, you know, are, are properly taken care of. Responsible ownership, I should say, is, is the term I was looking for. You know, we, we put in some best practices. We don't find if somebody is is um, is not keeping their chickens in a response in a uh, in a their chicken food in a, 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 a res proper receptacle, but we have it in there within the bylaw so that in case we have to inform um, residents that we can educate them and then move forward if we have to. Thank you. Uh, did you want to have another question before I move on to Council Lang? Like I, I got a. But yeah, go ahead. I'd if you don't mind, I just kind of had a yeah, no. bit of a call and response to that one, and then I'll I'll, I'll pass the mic back to you. And yeah. personally, I appreciate that there's a, a good amount of detail in this bylaw. Uh, one, uh, because as you said, it, it, it's educational, but also if a if a neighbor does have an issue with someone's chickens or someone thinks that they have an issue with their chickens first place they're probably going to look is in a, in a huff is they're going to Google the bylaw and they're going to say, well, that person only has blah. They can at least, when it's written out in front of them, it's clear rules for everybody. And we know there, you know, it, it's come, kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, what kind of training would be acceptable. I, I know it can feel maybe a bit pedantic and like we're holding people's hands at times uh, with the amount of detail that we can put in bylaws. But in some situations, I can see the benefit of having something fairly spelled out so that there's, uh, you know, uh, not as much question of what the answer is. Because some people, like myself, have bleeding hearts. And if I see a chicken outside that I think looks shivery, I'm going to be worried about that chicken. Uh, but I also have to recognize that I don't know anything about chickens. Um, so just because I'm worried about that one chicken doesn't mean that it's an actual problem. And I think having a bylaw that spells out the basic minimum of care and kind of sets that level. And, and I looked at it, and it does say, you know, food must be kept in a, in a I, I should look at it specifically here. And it says, I think, something along the Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I believe, sorry, put up with me for one second here while I just scroll through the document because I lost my place. Uh, it's, it does say that store feed in a fully enclosed non-penetrable container. So that's not, it's specific, but it's not specific to the point where we're providing the skew of a bin that they can purchase at Walmart. We're saying it, it needs to have a lid that the chickens and other animals are going to have some trouble getting into. So that, that's just my kind of comments back on why I like having a bit more detail in this bylaw. And, and perhaps the day when it comes that everyone knows how to take care of a chicken in the same way that we know how to take care of a dog, you know, for the same reason that we don't have to put how many minutes a day you need to walk your dog into a bylaw. It's because people know how to, in general, care for a dog. Um, chickens are new to a lot of people. Um, and I think having some more detail in there on how to care for them at a base level is, is helpful. And maybe one day when we're all experts, we won't need that, uh, that level of detail, but I think it's helpful now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Langmay. Deputy Mayor Montgomery. Um, thank you. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think it's a great idea to provide an information package. Like I, I'm always kind of saying, you know, let's provide an, provide an information package for this or that, you know, development, that kind of stuff. Um, I. I personally don't believe that law is the place to be educating people. Like, you don't need to insert education into law. Um, I, I think that's the purpose of an education package, to be honest. Um, and, you know, for something like, you know, I can, I can text, you know, by the, I can have a, a bag of grain, you know, sitting, you know, anywhere in my yard, you know, I could have a bag of grain sitting in my garage. But if I get a chicken, suddenly I have to have that 
same bag of feed in, in a certain type of container. And that's that, and I'm not gonna go on any longer about that, but that's, you know, it's, it's things for me have to make logical sense. You know, if we, you know, if we were, if, if our concern is about rodents, you know, getting to, uh, you know, bags or whatever, that's a perfectly legitimate, you know, concern, but we should be then outlawing bags of feed from people's yards, you know, and from people's properties. If, if that's, if that's the concern is the bags of feed. Uh, I'll move on though, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, where, where does it end? Um, so at what point is it okay to put, here's another question, it's a separate one. Um, at what point is it okay to put a chicken in the organic cart? And what I mean by that is, um, so it's, it's a dead chicken. Um, so I, obviously it says, you know, you can't put a, a, a dead chicken in the cart. Um, but if I, you know, if I buy a chicken from the grocery store and let's say, you know, it goes bad or whatever, I don't feel like eating it, I can throw that in the organic cart, right? Yes, but there's a difference between butchering a chicken and eating a chicken from the store. You have all the gizzards and everything that I don't, like growing up on a farm, it's, yeah. it's a very foul odor, very. It's... No, it sorry, I don't, like, oh, so you're saying, like, sorry, I, I grew up, I also grew up on a farm with chickens, so it, maybe, like, I'll, I'll understand what you're saying, but um, so the problem is um, the chicken from the store doesn't have what exactly? Like the guts, the intestine, the brains, okay. the everything. Okay, and so we, and don't, we don't want that in the organics. I guess that's saying. up to council, but I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. It would attract a lot of different... Well, no, my concern is more about, like, is that bad for the compost or is that, you know, is, is waste management, you know, they're against something like that being in there? Is that why we're saying that? I could reach out to waste management, but... Okay. I... Because, like, if I'll somebody... Like, the idea struck me, like, it's if, if somebody finds, like, a dead bird in their backyard, I, I don't think they're going to want to have to bring it to a vet or, you know, bring it to, like, you know, an, an abattoir or something like that. So what does somebody do with a dead bird that they find? Like, let's say a bird just crashes into a tree and dies. Like, what do they do with it? Good question. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but most people call Volker if they have any roadkill. I mean, I can't see anybody picking up a rabbit and putting it in their dumpster, but that's just, if they call us for an animal that's dead, that's what we, we call Volker or our town to assist. Yes, sorry. Uh, your worshiping council, um, I, I, I think we'll have to confirm with waste management on this, but in most places, uh, compost bins and things like that specify yard and food waste not dead animals. So even if you found a dead bird or a gopher in your yard, the objective is to not put that into your compost, it'd be into your garbage. Okay, and so we're saying that, and so. <laughs> food or, food or most, in most situations, compost containers are for yard and food waste. Yeah, okay, I, I totally get that, but so, but we're not saying that they can, put the dead chicken in their garbage though, right? They have to bring it to somewhere. Correct, for proper disposal. But they could, if a bird dies in their backyard, like just a robin or like. Into, into the garbage. Okay, why would we let them put that bird in the garbage but not another type of bird? Uh, well, I, I can't speak to that. I, your question first was about compost, and that's, that's where I'm... Right, I know, but I, I noticed that it, we, we specify how somebody would have to dispose of a dead chicken. And so I'm just wondering, like, what is the difference between a, a dead chicken versus a another type of dead bird that happens to die in their backyard? Through I'm a, I'm just going to make assumptions, probably based on the size of the, the dead bird. Okay. You're, you're not you're not seeing a lot of birds the size of a chicken that are dying in in your backyard, and so. But we'll have to confirm with that one as to. Again, these are these are best practices that, that are taken from you know City of Calgary, St. Albert, and other places like that. And so um, we'll have to explore as to why that, but we can come back to council wait with an answer for that one. Okay. Yeah, like I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I think I, I'm just, you know, I'm asking the people who are putting the bylaw in front of me why certain things are in there. So um, I yeah, I would appreciate that because um, Again, like it, we don't want to create a situation where you know it's like somebody is like going like, well, why can I throw this bird in here, but I can't throw that bird in there, and then they throw that bird in there, and suddenly they're breaking the law. And um... 
Oh, and my other question, my last question, thankfully, um, is uh, what happens if the neighbor, they, I see there's a form that the neighbor has to fill out. Um, what happens if the neighbor refuses to fill out the form? That's a good question. I'm sure the applicant can say, like, refusal, and that's part of the package. Would it, <laughs> what would you guys like to see? Well, I'm just, I'm just because like the, the idea struck me. It's like, okay, you need to like get this your neighbor to sign it, and let's say your neighbor doesn't sign it. You know, I, I'm just wondering what the difference is between you know, if you know your neighbor, you know, doesn't want you to have chickens, you could just not even show them the thing and just say, hey, my neighbor refused to sign it. Um, so I was just wondering, where's the, what is the process to actually confirm that the neighbor is or isn't fine with it if if the form is not filled out, essentially. So based on the bylaw, there's an appeal process that can take place where they have to go into the amount of days that they're allowed to basically appeal it, but they must have a valid reason why their neighbor cannot have a hen in their backyard. If they would be approved and accepted and they meet all the requirements, but just because the guy doesn't like chickens necessarily or hens, isn't suitable, I guess, or maybe you just don't like your neighbor to say he's not allowed to do that. He doesn't have control on what he would actually be applying for. And so you're saying if somebody didn't get that signed by their neighbor, they could still get the license for the chickens? Yes, if they didn't meet the requirements on how, what would make them not suitable to have hens in their backyard, then yes, they could. And thanks for answering all my questions. I understand some of them are uh, out there. I'm always happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, quick question for you. At no place in a bylaw would you ever specify a time period like a pilot project. Is that is that ever put into a bylaw? Can because you know I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to keep an open mind on this. But if we're going to do it, I would like to try it. I would like to suggest a pilot project just to to revisit it and see how it's gone after a period of time? Yeah, so I think Innisfail was the one who did a two-year pilot project, but I have to confirm, but one of them that I did research was pilot project, and there's a few other municipalities around that I didn't necessarily take a lot of information from, but they were pilots. So um, would, you be, uh, would you be okay to add that as an item in a bylaw, and then council can decide if they want that removed or not, or if they're not comfortable with that as part of a, a hen, backyard hen bylaw? I could do that, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. That would make me sleep better tonight. <laughs> I can count chickens in my sleep. It, it was Innisfail, Your, uh, Your Worship, in uh, March 2021, Innisfail Town Council passed a bylaw to initiate an urban hen pilot project. Okay, thank you, Councillor Peterson. Any other questions for our administration or Claudette? On the, do you have any uh, quips on your way out? No, we're good. <laughs> Thank you for your good. presentation and your willingness uh, and ability to answer all the questions that we've posed for you. So much appreciated. You're and Mark, thank you too. Expectations. Yes, you went beyond our expectations. 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 Hope it was Sorry. all you cracked up to put what you wanted it to be. <laughs> oh. All right, we are moving on to 5.2 Garden and Garage Suite Information, page 47 of your agenda. And um, Megan, you're presenting tonight? I am, Good yeah. evening and welcome. I'll turn it all over to you then. Turn it on. Just bear with me here. Okay. Good evening, your worship and members of council. I'm Megan Williams, planner three for the town of Strathmore. Um, I'm here to present information on garden and garage suites for you folks. Uh, garden and garage suites are also referred to as accessory dwelling units, laneway houses, in-law suites, and backyard suites, just to name a few. Uh, for ease throughout this presentation, what I'll do is I'll just refer to them as garden suites, just for an umbrella term. Um, so garden suites are a second dwelling unit on a parcel, typically in the rear yard, in a building separate from the primary dwelling. Garden suites are typically on a single floor, either at grade or on the second story above a garage. 
Currently, the town has 13 lots with approved garden suites on them, all on Strathmore Lakes Common. Council made a request last year to research garden and garage suites to discuss including them in the land use bylaw. This request was made quite timely as a number of housing reports being released across the country have identified housing affordability as a serious issue. Some of the recommendations these reports have made include increasing housing choices, decreasing red tape for developments, and preventing abuse of the development appeal system. Garden suites would be one way to increase housing choices within Strathmore. Allowing them throughout town would provide a number of benefits, including providing a source of income for the property owners, allowing for families to age or grow in place, increasing efficiency of external municipal um, of existing municipal infrastructure, so the water, wastewater, and stormwater, um, increasing rental properties within the town, retaining the character of the neighborhood, and diversifying housing types throughout town. Council has already made changes to the land use bylaw to increase housing choices. Secondary suites were added as a discretionary use in a low density resident into our low density residential districts in 2020. We've only had a handful of applications since, uh, the primary barrier being costs incurred when meeting building code requirements. Staff are expecting similar issues for homeowners if they retrofit an existing detached garage or they build a new garden suite. That said, in the 2022 budget, the federal government is proposing the multi-generational home renovation tax credit, which would provide up to 7,500 to homeowners who complete a renovation that creates a secondary dwelling unit for a senior or an adult with a disability to live in. If council wishes to allow garden suites throughout town, staff recommends we conduct a robust public engagement session. Uh, engaging the residents at the land use bylaw amendment stage will give staff and council an idea of how the residents feel about their garden suites, uh, will give us an opportunity to include regulations to mitigate their concerns, and will give us an opportunity to educate residents about garden suites. The intent would be to decrease any dissent from adjacent landowners when a development permit for a garden suite is submitted. Um, Although allowing garden suites won't completely solve the housing affordability issue, it will offer more housing choices to our residents, which is a step in the right direction. That does conclude my presentation, and so I'd like to open up the discussion to Council. Um, it'll be a new type of development for Strathmore, and we're really excited to see what Council's perspective is, uh, any concerns you might have, and whether there's uh, whether you guys would like to move forward with the amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Megan. Um, Councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you. What what do we currently allow for secondary suites in town? Is it is it kind of zone by zone different? Uh, and are there already any? You said there's no other garden seats other than those 13 in that one neighborhood. So the, I guess that's three questions. What do we currently allow? And is it zoned? And are there any other garden suites? So. Um, there's, there's only the 13 gardens, legal garden suites um, along Strathmore Lake Common there. Uh, there may be some other ones that are, they're not, they don't have a development permit, right? Um, we do allow secondary suites um, within a certain number in the low density residential districts. So like the, the R1, um, the R2, R2X and R2S, it, like the, just the smaller kind of single or semi-detached housing lots. Um, secondary suites, they're kind of, they would look more like this one here, uh, the interior lower level. So quite often you'll see them in basements. Um, they are part of the main house, though separate, if that makes sense. Um, we do, we don't have very many legal secondary suites in town. I think when I counted, there were about five. Um, again, that's not to say that there aren't a number of um, secondary suites that don't have all of their, their permits or their, their development permits. Um, were there, did I miss any of your questions there, Councillor Wiley? No, so I guess I was just, it's probably a bigger answer than that. I was just wondering, like, what is the process somebody goes about getting the permits to have secondary suites? Where can they have secondary suites? I just don't really know any of that background information. Oh, for sure. So um, in order to get a secondary suite, they'd have to apply for a development permit. And then part of that development permit includes building, um, electrical and plumbing safety code permits um, where they are required to meet building code uh, when they do the construction for the secondary suite. So there are specific uh, regulations within building code that they have to meet. And those are, that's where it kind of gets a little bit more expensive um, than just kind of doing like a basement development where you're adding like a couple of rooms in, right? Um, 
And then the other, I've already forgotten the second part of your question. I apologize. Uh, zoning. I was interested if they're only able to do that in certain neighborhoods. Sure. What I can do is I can pull up the land use bylaw. Hopefully I still have it up. I don't. Yeah, because while you're doing that, like I think the council from discussion I've been hearing between us is everyone's very interested in lower income housing or a variety of mm -hmm. income housing. Um, these are not going to be low income houses. Like uh, I think the report you wrote up said if a homeowner home is looking to retrofit an existing garage or construct new garage suite, the costs incurred to meet the code will be substantial. So these aren't going to be terribly cheap. Whereas we do already offer some secondary suite like to go through permits. I, I'm, and if there's only five right now in town that you can think of, Mm -hmm. Maybe there just isn't a demand or is the supply or is I'm just where's the breakdown? I I can only speculate. Unfortunately, I don't have a hard and fast answer for you. Through the chair, if I could offer uh, some information, I think the biggest barrier often is and, and Megan did refer to it is some of the safety codes requirements. Um, and in, in my time in municipal governments, that's often the, cha the biggest challenge an applicant will have. Uh, some of those requirements are quite high. Uh, Megan mentioned plumbing and, and electrical being the two big ones. Um, so we're not expecting that these amendments, if we do go forward, will solve the issue, but it will increase the housing choice and be a step in the right direction, we're hoping. But I guess the, the safety codes won't be any less for these garden and garage suites. So I'm not saying I'm against it, I'm just, I'm interested in why we're not having a greater demand for people to, to put in secondary suites and would this garden and garage suites actually even resolve that issue? Um, and then how, many of, how much of that red tape that's uh, slowing people down from doing these secondary suites, how much of that is on us and, or is it all provincial regulations? There's too many questions here. I guess I'm just starting to, to put my head around all this. Thank you, Councillor Wiley. Um, I know in my own thinking, I, I, I just thought that this might add um, more inventory for different types of rentals so that a, a large family might have an option to, uh, to uh, rent a, a garden suite, a, a detached garage, for example. The other thing is I, I thought it might be a good way for a young couple to get started and they, they can find an affordable rental. I don't, I don't expect it to be a, a low cost rental, but it might get, get them a start to be able to find a, a nice uh, rental unit that's up to code so they can maybe save for a, a property. Or uh, the other thing I, I thought of as far as this goes was it uh, could, <laughs> could be a way for seniors. I just remember an earlier council meeting from before. It could allow seniors to stay in their homes longer because um, uh, they'd be able to get help on their mortgage or it would bring in extra revenue so that if their house is paid off, they could have money coming in. And if you factor in the cost of doing it, you know, eventually over time it could make sense for them. Um, I think our next person is Deputy Mayor Montgomery. Um, so I, I personally think it's a good idea to allow these um, under certain circumstances, of course. Um, I have a question about the existing policy that we have. Um, and, and I guess like I'll make, so one question I have is like it mentions that, um, that garden suites uh, can only be one story and have a maximum height not to exceed five meters. So th that's something we would probably get rid of, uh, or does that include, like, is, are we saying that the living area is a maximum of five meters? Like if somebody stuck it on a garage, obviously it'd be higher than that. Um, so is that just, is that something that we'll probably change in the upcoming, if we were to do one? It is something that we could look at, yes. Okay. Um, and then the other point, I guess, that I'll make is, uh, so I, I saw that, um, it mentions that uh, 
the utilities must first be connected to the primary residence and then fed to the garden suite. Um, so where somebody has like their utilities, like let's say power coming in through the rear of their property, it would probably be better to allow them to, like I've seen in Calgary, for instance, like some people have like a, a main panel in their garage and then they feed their, their house with the panel from the garage, like a sub panel. Um, so I think it would probably be better to allow people that option rather than saying, you know, you have to route it to your house first and then you can route it back to your garage um, personally. Uh, and those are my only two points. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Deputy Mayor Montgomery. Councillor Peterson and Councillor Langmead. Thank you, Your Worship. And, and thank you, Megan. Am I, I have a, a wish list, and, and I, I know that um, that, that uh, is simply... Um, you know, a consideration and, and not a not a done deal by any means. But when I when I think about this initiative, I think about it in terms of what this community can do to encourage both affordable and supportive spaces. And what I from from my very personal uh, perspective, those are the two major considerations that we have in the community today that drive this is a lack of affordable spaces. And the second one is in a lack of supportive space in order to be able to encourage people to find affordability in their existing home or their existing living space. So we have examples of people who, through increased utility costs, 8% inflation, are just simply struggling to, to maintain existence within their homes. So that affordability and supportive space for me, seems to drive this. So my question then for, for council in this term is, what can we do to see this happen? What are the kinds of things that we could do? So my wish list would encourage those things that you spoke to, but, but also there, there are some tremendous advantages currently because the federal government has just come out with this, this funding project that you spoke to, and, and so that that is available. And, um, and we have... Uh, the people that were in front of us earlier today and talking about um, access to uh, some economic boosts in community in terms of, of labor and employment. And so if we were to create a surfeit of spaces in this community, or at least a needful space, that would impact the affordability that Councillor Wiley spoke to. So right now, five or 13 spaces are certainly not going to impact affordability. It's just not happening. But if we made it so that, that, that this would be easy for people to access, we could have a lot more spaces. And having more spaces would then impact the, the cost that people were charging. It's just an economy of scale issue. And I know that Councillor Mitzner speaks to this often in terms of, of economy of scale and, and how, we could, um, how we could lend ourselves to this community. And if we could put together programs with local lending authorities and with uh, understanding how the, the um, access of accessing the federal grants would work. And we could then do a, 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 a permit fees coordination 101 process for, for people. If everything that we could do to mitigate those intimidating factors that would prevent people from doing this. And, and I think that um, Jamie spoke to you know, safety codes and, you know, building codes, putting in utilities, um, and that whole, that whole thing around the permit process. If we, could, if we could put together a process that would take away those intimidating factors, uh, I think it would lend itself very, very well to, to promoting what we want to accomplish. Because I don't think the bylaw alone will do that. And I do think that there's things that we could do to really boost the the economy um, in terms of this and make Strathmore an affordable, um, supportive place to live. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, and um, these garden suites might be really good as far as creating an inventory of a wide variety of things to possibly choose from for rental. And um, Jamie and Megan, um, just to prepare you and, and give you a heads up, I've been approached by a community member regarding tiny homes and a possible tiny home, home area. So this could, this 
garden suite concept could be a part of a bigger picture as far as different types of housing that different people might be able to then draw from and, and go to based on their own uh, income levels. So uh, next, I'll go to Councillor uh, Langmaid. Thank you very much. Uh, I just, I wanna make sure that I understand uh, the different categories of buildings that we're talking about here. So there's garden suites, and then there are garage suites. Now a garden suite, can only, this is, I'm just stating what I understand from what I've written, or read, sorry. A garden suite can only be one story, but a garage suite can be two stories, consider, roughly two stories once you add the garage underneath of it. Why would we, I guess, like I, under, I understand that one part's just a garage, but from say a visual disturbance or disturbance of neighbors, the, the, whether it's a garage or a two story building really doesn't make any difference. So why are we only allowing one story garden suites but two story garage suites? It's, it's a good question. Um, I think the idea is to make sure that these, these spaces, these kind of accessory dwelling units are smaller than the, the primary residence. Um, it is something we can definitely look at uh, when we, or if, if council wishes to, to kind of review the, um, the allowable living area for, for garden suites, if they want to increase it, if they want to allow it to be spread out over two, uh, two floors. Um, when I was looking for images for the presentation, there were quite a number of like garage suites that did use a small part of the first floor as well as having living space above the garage. Um, so it's not, um, it, it wouldn't be wild, I don't think, to, uh, to suggest it. Yeah, I'm just, uh, that was a thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking that doesn't seem, if, if it's a visual thing, then really there's no visual difference. But it, uh, and then the other question I had is kind of on the lines of the tiny home idea is could you do something like a tiny home as a garden suite? So something that maybe isn't necessarily as big as we're talking about. Because, I, you know, one, th one thing that I'm noticing is you know, not everyone is going to have a yard that's going to be able to do this. Um, you're, to do it exactly like this, that, that is a dang big yard because you got to be, you know, four meters from your house, half a meter from all other buildings. So if you have a shed or a, anything like that. Um, so yeah, could you, could you in theory use a tiny home, maybe one that's even not in theory connected to septic? Just to give you a headache? I see you rubbing your face over there like, I, in theory, is that something that could be done? Uh, you know, uh, someone wanted through, to spend the, a little less? Through the chair, I can take a shot at that one. I mean, in theory, uh, the answer is yes. Um, typically, and we haven't got into the details of what the kind of requirements of garden slash garage shoots will be. We'll do that when we get some public engagement done and find out what people will tolerate. and. The other thing we have to keep in mind, we don't want to create a whole bunch of red tape if we're trying to enable this. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is going to be finding that balance. Um, the septic question is more of a building code question. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm I, not a building code expert. So I yeah, so uh, uh, my guess is no, we can't probably have a septic tank for a tiny home, but a tiny home in terms of form, sure, could be a garden suite. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I had one more question. Am I, am I going to be able to remember what it was? Oh, yes, I am. Um, I notice here garden suites, uh, oh, where is it? All lots with a garden suite shall have a driveway that provides access to the garden suite. So we're not, everything must have either a parking spot or a driveway or something. There's no option to put in a garden suite without any additional parking. Is that right? If I, if Megan, I may, yep. um, through, through the chair. Um, these, these regulations were written with those, those 13 lots in mind. And so all of them do have um, a driver connecting to them. Um, again, like looking through other regulations, um, most of what was consistent was that there was at least one parking spot allowed for the, 
for the second or sorry for the garden suite um but not necessarily all of them have a driveway um so it is something that we can look at most definitely well, that's that's something that i'd like to be considered because the uh, people living in the garden suite it, it might be a young couple who's renting it it might also be your 90 year old mother that doesn't drive um so you know if you're looking if you're looking to put in a garden suite so that you can bring your mother to live in with you and you're going well she's not she's 90 she doesn't drive anymore why do i have to put in a put in a driveway to her to her garden suite um, right now. I gotta, just just something to consider that we might want some flexibility there because there's a lot of different reasons that people might want a garden suite. Maybe they have uh, an, an adult child that has a disability that isn't it can't move out independently but needs it, but can have some independence in their life and you know not not every situation will need a driveway or or additional parking. So just I, I understand why we have that in there and why it's an important consideration, but I think I don't want to create additional red tape here either that makes somebody spend an extra, I'm not even sure how much a driveway would cost, to be honest, but extra money on something that they're just not, they don't need for what they're trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Langmaid. So as far as direction from Council then, um, I think we're interested in hearing more, so then you folks would go away and start to look at ways to publicly engage? And then we'll deal with tiny homes as a separate issue. I would imagine that probably be the cleanest thing to do for this, Jamie. Uh, through the chair, I mean, we're we're going to be looking at probably tiny homes as a perhaps another land use district or a type. But um, you know, like I said earlier, the form in theory might be able to fit into the parameters of of a garden suite as well. Um, so we'll look at it in both ways. Thank you. So uh, we'll just wait to hear a report back as far as when your what your next steps will be. Perfect. Thank you. All right, any other comments or questions from councillors? Okay, thank you, Megan, for your presentation and your ability and willingness to answer questions. Jamie, thank you, too, for stepping in at times. It does help us wrap our heads around this a lot better. So thank you. Uh, that brings us to six question and answer period. Are there any questions and answers from those questions? Seeing none. Then at this time, I guess we're looking for a motion to go in camera. Councillor Langmead. I'll move that council move in camera to discuss items related to sections 19.2 and 24.1a of the Freedom of, uh, Freedom of Information and Privacy Protection Act at 7.42 p.m. Thank you for that motion, Councillor. You've all heard the motion. All in favor? And we are going in camera at 7.42. To the public at home, thank you for watching. To our 